Technology Summit, day three of NR Week. Hope you guys are having a good week so far. And uh, if you guys have gone out to enjoy some of the night activities as well, hope you guys got some sleep at least. We at NI, there's, there's two major reasons that we look forward to NI Week. One is because most of us work in a certain application space at one time anyways. And it's an opportunity for us to see all the really cool stuff that, that all of our customers are doing uh, with NI products. And you know, we, we're, we're working to, for me, it's cliche, but it changed the world. But we're seeing what you guys do to do that, you know, make something more efficient, or faster, or more secure, or less expensive, um, or to be able to bring something to a wider audience, or something like that. Um, the second reason is because we get to look forward to that feeling uh, where you get a full night of sleep after have not being able to do that for a month straight. So we're very excited about that as well. <laughs> um, I, my background, so I'm, I'm a, I have kind of several hats at NI. Um, I've only been at NI for about a year and a half, but uh, I'm the co-coordinator uh, for the Energy Technology Summit along with my colleague Brett Berger. Um, I also uh, seasonally am the team leader for FIRST Robotics at NI, so I released the Robo Rito last year specifically for FIRST, um, and so my team did the documentation and the phone support and the forum support and all that kind of stuff, the logistics that go along with that. Um, I also am in the Applications Engineering umbrella, so I do our tech support sometimes, so if your stuff is broken, we might have spoken on the phone, and hopefully we got it fixed. And even if we didn't, hopefully you'll have to be really concerned. My background from, uh, I have a, an undergraduate degree uh, from the Colorado School of Mines in Engineering Physics. Uh, I got most of my undergrad classes done by junior year, so my senior year I just did a bunch of uh, uh, graduate electives, uh, electric chemistry, and uh, photovoltaics, and in the lab I worked with uh, thermoelectrics, um, and I planned to go that direction, but my advisor said that there's some pretty significant limitations uh, in that field right now, so might not have been the best idea for me to pigeonhole myself with, with that thing. Uh, but it was really cool science, uh, so I switched over and did some uh, electric chemistry, uh, working with graduates, measuring fuel cells, and that kind of stuff, material science in general. Um, worked with solar shortly after that, I like the idea of, of renewables, and I like working with renewables, but uh, eventually ended up at NI because I wanted to kind of broaden. I wanted to do, uh, I believe, in the, an approach from all angles uh, to whatever the world's problems are. We can hit it from all angles and work on it together from all different industries and, uh, and help improve everything, not just from one angle. Uh, and so in the Energy Technology Summit, we have uh, speakers and presentations uh, from all these different uh, uh, application spaces. And yesterday was really exciting, so a lot of really great presentations, and today we have some great ones as well, so I hope you enjoy um, our first presenter. So excuse me for just a moment. All right. Thanks for your patience there. Uh, so first presenter here, Dr. Mark A. Buckner. He's a senior research scientist at the Oak Ridge National Labs and the leader of the Power and Energy System Group, known as PNDS. Uh, he has over 25 years of experience specializing in signal processing, machine learning, and computational intelligence. And prior to becoming the PNDS group leader, uh, he was the director of uh, the Oak Ridge National Labs Cognitive Radio Program. He is champion and principal investigator of uh, a few things, a continuous data-driven model development framework for the grid, a grid seer, which is grid software, elastic, extensible resiliency, an FPGA-based high-performance grid simulator, Delphi, distributed enterprise-level cyber-physical intelligence, which is an internal R&D effort focusing on enhancing grid resiliency and cyber-physical situational awareness, uh, for bio-inspired approaches to transduction, signal processing, learning, and cognition, uh, as well as novel machine learning approaches for signal mining, and software-defined instrumentation and cognitive control for secure, resilient energy delivery systems. Um, that's really all he does. <laughs> um, he has served on the DOD RFID Technical Advisory Working Group and several other technical advisory uh, uh, groups. He currently is the Secretary of IEEE P2030.7 standard for the specification of microgrid controller. Uh, a member of National Instruments Group of Elite Educations, the Oak Ridge STEM Leadership Committee, Chairman of uh, Tennessee First Team Development Committee, and the lead mentor of First Robotics Team 4265, Secret City Wild Wild. Mark holds a BA in Physics and Psychology from Carson Newman College, 
and a master's and PhD in nuclear engineering and applied artificial intelligence from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark A. Buckner. Well, thanks, Jeff. It's a, it's a privilege to be here today. Um, this is my third year of being in NI Week. I'm always fascinated by the, by the depth and breadth of technology, but more than that, the ecosystem of the kind of people that work with and engage this technology. Uh, Jeff hinted at the fact that I'm, uh, well, actually, he didn't hint at the fact, he kind of showed you the fact. I'm a master of many things, uh, excuse me, a jack of all trades, but a master of none, is the way you should say it, right? I've worked at Oak Ridge National Laboratory 28 years. I was counting up the other day that I'm now on my 11th career at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And that stemmed from everything from the design of integrated circuits, so I had a team that did that, to active RFID, to bio-inspired systems, to cognitive radio, to network transducers, to environmental monitoring and, and remediation, to now the hat that I'm wearing as the group leader of the Power Navy Systems Group. And so what is unique about this opportunity is I've worked with a really, really great bunch of people that are phenomenal and intelligent and smart at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I have been a, a, an entrepreneur. So anytime we have an idea or something that we want to pursue, we, we have to find the funds and the network of people to be able to do it. But I can go down the street just about, knock on the door, and find a world-class expert in almost any field that's there. So if you're humble enough to go and ask and admit that you don't know what you don't know, some of these other guys are more than happy to tell you about the things that they know, and you can try to pull together some phenomenal teams. But what I'm going to highlight today is really kind of capstone of some of those activities, but particularly in the area of, uh, of, of energy. And um, so what we're going to share with you is a vision of where we're trying to go as a research community and, and tell you a little bit about the things that we've done over the last year uh, to put these uh, systems together. I've only been wearing this hat for a little bit over 18 months, and for me it's an experimental endeavor. I've been a research scientist, as I said, for 28 years. I've never been in management. So I'm currently a group leader trying to pull together a, a group to do some things that we could never do on our own. So you'll hear a little bit about that. Part of our reason to be here is to work on connecting a network of people, to work on things that are, that are broader than us. Our, and our mission is, is to provide innovative solutions to the global energy challenges that face us. But the key part for us is to be able to accelerate the science and the research into practice. And so there's a lot of things that NI stands for, and things that we've heard this week that enable and unlock that. So we're going to unpack a few of those things as we, as we go through here. Well, as I hinted at, this is not possible on my own. Actually, the remote appears to be too far away. All right, There we go. We got super. So here's just a handful of the latest folks that we've been working with at Oak Ridge. Uh, there's a whole slew of folks that have been critical and instrumental in, in developing the things that you're going to see today, and building a network of researchers and collaborators at NI. And this is this has been a phenomenal opportunity in the last couple of days to meet face to face with some of the voices that I've heard over the phone for the last number of months to put this together. And this is only a small part of the team of the things that you're going to see here. Not not everyone together, but I'm greatly indebted to, to these folks for their energy, for their excitement, for their creativity, and for the willingness to work together as a team and do some pretty cool stuff. So these are, these are part of the folks. The Oak Ridge National Laboratory is the largest multi-science lab in the Department of Energy Complex, which means they do a lot of different things. That also makes us, in my opinion, uniquely positioned to work on challenges like this. They're interdisciplinary challenges that face uh, a lot of problems that aren't just for the U.S., but they're global, right? So we're able to reach out and pull together a lot of technology to do this. So we're going to highlight some of those as we go through. So what's our motivation as we put together the platform that we're about to share with you? Well, part of it is the modernization of the grid. We're working with the technology that dealt with was heralded as the most critical innovation of the 20th century. It's somewhat brittle and lacks innovation. So it has sort of been left behind in the technology revolutions that we've all experienced in communications, in Wi-Fi and so many other things. We're dealing with a lot of sunk costs and a lot of large systems and, and legacy systems there. So as we look to modernize these technologies, there's been some studies done, one of which is the grid modernization multi-year plan by the Department of Energy. And if you look at this and you identify critical needs that are facing us moving into the future, some, and only some of the critical needs are highlighted here 
from sensing measurements and control. We just saw today. Big analog data. The grid is a living entity with its tentacles that reach out across the world. But without electricity, almost everything that you and I depend on is fall to dust. From commerce to communications to health to food distribution, all of these things are critically dependent rely on electricity. So it's an essential aspect of the things that we do. The ability to do multi-level coordination and optimization, modeling and simulation, cybersecurity, and one of the key factors is two-way power flow. We're going to have to transform from a model that generates and just sends electricity to you as a consumer and develop and enable a whole new world, a whole paradigm as you as prosumers uh, being able to produce electricity and energy and to sell that potentially on the open market. Just like today with the flattening of the world with the internet, the internet of things, you can produce something and sell it electronically over the web. And because we have the connectivity, we've got a market that's never been realized and touched before. To highlight this, I, I came in a year ago to our group and told them that our mission was to unlock human potential. So they thought, oh, wait, you're a grid guy, you know, how in the world is making power and energy unlock human potential? And you've all seen this photograph before, the satellite image of the world at night, right? Famous NASA photograph, and you see where the light is, where the lights are, where, where nations are electrified. But then if you would overlay on top of that map world population, you would see the most significant portion of the world lacks electricity. And not only do they lack electricity, they also lack clean water. So I told them if we could be part of the scientific revolution and provide global access to low-cost, reliable electricity and pure, clean drinking water, what would people do? Most people in these places spend most of their day looking for water or food. Why? Because it can't be stored, or without clean water, they die. So now, these people have the ability to unlock their creativity and imagination to solve so many more of our global problems. So that's not a great mission for all of us to, to, to jump into and be a part of it. I don't know what is. So this highlights part of it. The other thing I'll highlight is that the things that we're talking about and we've heard this week are really cross-cutting enabling platform technologies. Smart grids, smart buildings, smart vehicles, transformative manufacturing, the industrial internet of things, all of these will be enabled by the types of technologies and platforms that we're all a part of making alive. So the things that we're describing here are cross-cutting. They're not siloed. They gives us the ability to put together a multiplication factor on our transformation. A couple other than these as we look forward, there's a great quote here from the International Conference on Federated Automatic Control. And the quote is to transform the current grid to an end-to-end -end digitalized intelligent self-healing grid, which is a system of systems. There are many challenges that are going to have to be addressed before deployment can really begin. We're seeing pockets of deployment, right? We're seeing pockets of innovation. But to really see the transformation, we as a community have to put together an ecosystem to address these technical challenges and to transition them from the mines and from the, the holds of research into practice as fast as possible. And so these are reliability and resiliency. Well, the grid's pretty reliable. It's multiple mines reliable if you look at the latest data. But the, one of the things that it's not really good at is resiliency. Look at problems with storms and weather events and other types of things. So how can we introduce some intelligence and some resiliency into the grid? And not only that, predictive resiliency. We heard mentioned this morning, what if you make a weather resilient grid? We can predict weather path, patterns and weather paths. What if we reconfigure our grid to make it resilient and wrap power before it comes through? And then dynamically change on what happens after the fact. There's a utility that we're working with that has the ability to do that today. The electric power board of Chattanooga is probably one of the most innovative, automated utilities in the world. A couple dozen, well not even a dozen years ago, a handful of years ago they invested in fiber networks in their communication systems. So now they have fiber to practically every home in Chattanooga. And that fiber allows them to share information but yet also pull information back. Their smart meters are fully instrumented but they're also providing data and internet services to the customers. So what you're seeing is a transformation to a services-oriented architecture for the things that we do today, providing services. And so I think that's a transformative model when we look at a business model. But the really neat thing about it is, is I saw a video 
clip of something that happened a little over a year ago on automatic power restoration. So because of the intelligence and the automated interrupters that they have in their system, they showed where a tornado had passed through the Tennessee Valley, and you can see in real time power failing. Well, as the front went behind, you saw power coming back on. So it restored power and rerouted electricity dynamically in an automated fashion, saving them not only customer outages and financial outages at that point, but also minimized the number of truck rolls that had to happen. Because now you can put the right people in the right place. So that's just one example where big analog data, the Internet of Things, the ability to sense and to see in real time the assets that are there and the people that you're managing bring together a multiplying factor in innovating the grid in the future. So that's a really neat opportunity. But resiliency is a key piece. Some of the other technical challenges as we face distributed energy resources and microgrids is, as I mentioned before, two-way power flow. We're not set up to do that very well. And when we look at doing that, another critical need is protection. So how can we protect, and in this case it's electrical protection of our electrical workers. Right now there's resistance to enabling the home user to have their own self-sustained electricity of solar and energy storage because they don't have true situational awareness and confidence if they blow a roll of line crew out that you're not back feeding power back into the grid from a safety and reliability of, of human operators. But can we do it with big analog data, situational awareness, and isolation? You absolutely could. So we can address some of the fears and the concerns that are there by these kind of technologies. So complex protection schemes and looking at, at, at these opportunities are, are huge. And we heard a little bit about one of those at the keynote this morning some of the things that are beginning to pull, pull together for that. The other has to do with control, coordination, and op op optimization of the assets and the resources that we have available. This could be everything from ancillary services for st stability uh, to energy management systems and automating and optimizing from an economic standpoint, uh, the production and the load in a collaborative ecosystem, this distributed, cooperative, coordinated controls, but the truly future is a network of cooperative systems that almost looks like what? What is it? Internet. Looks like the internet, but it's more than the internet, right? It's more than the internet. So I'm going to pose that and I'll let you think about this in a minute as we unfold it. The other thing I'll point to this is that there is a phenomenal economic opportunity. Navigate just produced a market research that says they believe the U.S. market alone, the North American market alone, will be 40 billion in microgrids by 2020. The other factor that's driving this is the plummeting costs of solar and energy storage. So when you see the acceleration of these technologies, we have to be prepared as a community to enable the integration of these technologies to take full advantage of them. So it's going to drive research to do it. So what are we doing? Well, one of the things we've done in the past is we've been working on an open research platform for microgrids. When you look at it, microgrids are a system of systems, right? Everything from components and devices to systems to systems of systems. Uh, Jeff actually elucidated very early this morning what the biological systems were. So I have led and championed for a number of years biomimetic research. We've actually implemented algorithms that do retinal pre-processing and visual decomposition and reassembly in the, in the visual cortex. Well, there's another perfect example of that in the auditory system. If you and I as engineers were attempting to produce what goes on inside the human ear in the auditory system, what would we do? Well, we'd say we want to have the highest fidelity transducers we can, right? The best dynamic range. Uh, we all know that human hearing range is from about 20 kilohertz to about 20 hertz, right? So if using Nyquist, we want to sign at least twice that. So we build our engineering system and do that. And then we begin looking at how do we process the signals. Well, we'll buy an FFT, right? Well, what you begin to understand in biological systems is they don't operate that. They do processing at the edge, and they pass information that's contextualized to the other centers to integrate information to provide context and just-in-time information. Why? So you can interact with the real world. So there's some really cool systems and things that we can learn from that. There's been some great reproduced systems. If you look at the brain of a bat, about the size of a walnut, the amount of signal processing that a bat does would blow you away. And the power that it takes to do that is nothing like what we do today. 
So we can look at that for inspirations of intelligence at the edge and, and signal processing. And I would argue, not explicit, but implicit signal processing. So part of that requires systems that can learn to learn. Goal-directed, interacting with their environment and adjusting and adapting in real time to meet the goals with just the amount of information passing up and down from the top to the edge to facilitate the resiliency of that type of system. And I'm going to hint at some of those as we go through this talk on why what I'm building, I believe, will en enable us to look at some of those kind of research opportunities. So as I took over this room, I told them I was building a sandbox to explore what I call the cognitive group. And so we'll see how maybe some of these things will help us to do that. So as I was point out here, we're utilizing in our hardware and software to create an open microgrid reference platform to accelerate research. And again, it's to go from idea to implementation and back again. Why? Because that's the fastest way to learn. When you've got to wait to get feedback from your experiment or anything else, you lose the creativity and the opportunity to accelerate the innovate. So we're doing that. The others are creating a framework and an architecture that truly is modular, well-defined interfaces. The ability to reconfigure and dynamically motivate and change the elements that are there so that you can get results faster. So we're putting together pieces parts like that and primarily the microgrid space to, to look at control optimization, we're looking at standards development. We heard about interoperability this morning, so one of the things we're trying to do is to position the lab to be on the front end of the development cycle. We hear a lot about test beds, but what if we integrated a research platform to go from idea to research to transition to test beds all on a common platform? So the things that we learn in research can rapidly be filled back to the test bed piece so that we can look at manufacturing and integration at that point to facilitate accelerated interoperability. We all saw what, what just happened in the Wi-Fi industry. If you, many of you are old enough in here today to, to, to have owned some of the early Proxim access points and devices. What you learned in the early days is that multiple manufacturers were compliant with the standard, but their own interpretation of the standard. And so you lacked true interoperability because of the challenges and the things that were there. So the real needs there as we move forward. So we're looking at that, communications and, and things that are there. So we're really truly building an object-oriented architecture for research with hardware and software. Why? Because it simplifies complexity, it allows us to create systems that scale. So one of the things we're doing is we're working on a standard for microgrid controllers, IEEE P2030.7, and we're taking the best of the things that have been out there and putting those into a reconfigurable platform that allows us to take the definitions and use cases that are there today and rapidly iterate on those to look at the implementation of the communications and to handle all the use cases that we're looking at. But not only for microgrids now, we haven't even begun to imagine the use cases that microgrids will need to face in just two to five years with the, with the proliferation of technology in there. So we need an agile research platform that allows us to be able to do those kinds of things. So some of the things we're looking at is prediction. We've so long looked at week ahead and day ahead prediction of the grid, and so you look for the energy that you will produce and need the following day. Well, if we can reduce the uncertainty in our predictions, we can radically change how we need to build out and scale the grid and the things that we need, which means it needs to be smarter in prediction. But that prediction needs to be not only load, but as we're starting to talk about renewables, the availability of renewables. And how do those work together? And at what time scale do you need to do that? And they're differing time scales. But just like you and I, as we get closer to the just-in-time need, our predictions ought to get better. Right? So we need to create this ecosystem that allows us to do that. To do good enough predictions a week out, or a year out, or a day out. But for example, in solar, and most of you, if you've done work in solar, you have seen this. You can go from 100% solar panel output to single digits. How fast? Just like that. What's it take? A big goofy cloud to get between you and the sun. And so as a result, what does it do? It reduces ripple and frequency instability and all kinds of things. And if you've got a big farm and they're connected in series, guess what that does? It radically changes the efficiency and the effectiveness of doing it. But what if we had solar panels that could see the sky? Guys, it's easy to predict when a cloud's coming out of the sun, right? That's not real tough. But why don't we build a system that does that? So before it happens, we can shift off the way that we're going to configure or the energy that we've time shifted because we've been able to store some of that energy that we've had peak capacity, you know, we take advantage of the dump curve. 
as opposed to letting it be on the internet. But it requires intelligent, reconfigurable, modular systems to do those kinds of things. And so we need that as we look at research. So that's one of the things that we're looking at trying to do in the production piece. And then all the functions that we're going to face from energy management, protection and control, resiliency, transactions, and interface and data management. So, how are we getting there? Well, we've created something we've called the software defined grid. So, you've got to realize that for the last 10 years, I've been a software defined radio guy. Uh, I was actually been privileged enough to be a lead user on some of the early days of the vector signal transceiver because we were doing some of these things for radios. So, we were measuring things in the electromagnetic spectrum that told us the health of the devices, or better than that, we were creating a way to do multi-factor authentication to recognize the voice of a wireless device. So today I've spoken on the phone enough with Brian and clearly that I can just pick, on the phone, pick up the phone and know that it's him. Why? Because I've got embedded speaker recognition, if you want to think of it that way, for Brian's voice. Well, there are artifacts that ride in the coloration of the signals, not only from wireless communication devices, but from every electromagnetic and every electromechanical device that's out there. It's unique. The variation in the components and the tolerances. So why don't we take a playbook from nature and extract the features and utilize those from a ground up series of authentication and built-in metadata that not only lets you recognize the speaker, but it lets you recognize the health. Probably a couple of months ago, I picked up the phone and I heard Brian talking to me like this. So what did I know? And then Brian had a cold, right? We can do the same things with our systems if we can embed intelligence in context to be those kind of things. So anyway, we're developing, we're, we're developing this environment where software-defined grid meets software-defined network meets machine intelligence and subscription architecture. So how do we do that? So we've created the software-defined intelligent grid research and integration and development framework and platform to be able to do that. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So what we built out first off is a low-voltage series of microgrids. In this case, low voltage is 24 volts. And the reason we're doing that is because they are touch safe. So I don't have to worry about our flash. But you know what? I can fault it. And I'm not losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment. So what's even better than that? Guess what's happening in the controllers? We're using the Rio architecture. So this is three phase fully operational. We'll look at it in a second. We've got solar panels and solar inverter generation. We have energy storage. Oh, by the way, we have mixed chemical. We've got lead acid, lithium ion, and other batteries. So we're, we're developing models of chemistry agnostic energy storage to be able to do that, and the inverters that play into that. We have a load bank, and in this case, it's a very simplistic load bank for 24 volts. We're doing resistive, but we're also going to be doing um, inductive. But in this particular case, we can vary the light bulbs that we hook up in series or in parallel dynamically to dynamically change the loads. And you know what? This can look like a community in Atlanta or it can look like a good community in Austin. Because we've had research that, that has looked at energy consumption, whether you're a teenage girl or a retired or whoever you are and what time of year, and he actually has created using Markov chains an energy consumption profile based on aggregate users that look a heck of a lot like the way that we use them. So as a result, we can program the load bank at this level. We can use the same profiles, and we are for our 480 microgrid and other pieces of community energy storage. And then we also have the ability, and we have inverter-based machines. We have synchronous generation. We have loads. So it looks like everything that you're going to see on the grid in the microgrid is just operating in three-phase 24 volts. So the thing that it allows us to do is to see the system dynamics that you're never going to see in a simulation. It's going to be impossible to simulate this at this level of fidelity to be able to build those kind of models that you need. So we're building this ability. We can change multiple devices. We can, in a software-defined switching configuration, we can change the topology of this microgrid research. So we can actually make it look like the microgrid here or the microgrid somewhere else and begin to run research scenarios and other things. And the really, really cool thing about it is the control of algorithms on the, on the Rio we're actually migrating up to operational microgrids. And we can talk about that in a minute. So the software-defined microgrid and this is the topology. Right now we're using single board Rios and GPIX, uh, the uh, general purpose inverter controllers that are at uh, lower voltage and lower, lower power. We're changing the IGBTs and the power out and some of the other things to, to, to scale up. So it provides a lot of flexibility and a lot of power uh, to be able to do these sorts of things. The other neat thing that we're doing, and we can 
this a little bit, others planting a seed, we're running a digital twin. We're running a hardware in the loop, co-simulation, real-time model. But what we're working on is not only the power electronics, but the other pieces of it. So our dream is to do the motor. So you've got electromagnetic and electromechanical. Because when you've got an inverter-driven motor, you've got both, right? Or when you have battery chemistry, you need to link those pieces together. And there's a lot of things that we're going to be able to do this, but in this particular case, we've got a model that can be parameterized in an embedded piece of AI that's learning those parameters in real time. So you can design a model, you can deploy it as this digital twin. The cool thing about this is, is it'll run, it will learn those parameters so that it minimizes the error between what it's predicting and what it's actually measuring, and then guess what happens? We're going to pass those parameters up to a simulator that has system response. So just like you and I build a model of the world as we interact with it. That's why you can ride a bike. That's why you can get a fast pitch baseball, or you should be able to do it if you're like me. It's because you build a model of the physical world that allows you to predict ahead of time, anticipate ahead of time, what needs to be done so you can maintain stability and control and react to things. And the cool thing about it is, is the I.O. between those loops are very, very minimal. Matter of fact, you only get an interrupt when something deviates from what you expect. So when you're riding a bike and you get a bump, or when you're walking, and if you've ever done this, if you've ever tried to walk upstairs and you get to a staircase that the spacing is a little bit different, you kind of stumble. Right now, you don't think about it. You don't think how you got here from the last session. The grid's got to operate that, like that in the future. So you've got to build a grid that learns to learn, and adapt, and coordinate, and communicate. So this is the foundational piece that's going to enable us to do some of these kind of things as we build this up. Here's an HDMI front panel. The other is, is to provide an interface so machines don't care, right? We can pass communication back and forth. But you and I, as users of the technology and, and co-living beings with the technology, need to have an interface with the technology. So we're working also in areas of human-machine interface and other kind of things. And this is just a simplistic representation that allows what I would call human on the loop. The grid. At the microgrid scale, happens so fast, you and I will never be in the loop for control. <laughs> we'll never be in the loop for the inverters. But we can provide our contextual guided knowledge to be on the loop. And in a symbiotic relationship, do things with technology that we could never do on our own or we could do on its own. So that's, that's an example. And again, we're using LabVIEW to be able to exploit that and take advantage of that. So to give you a hint how we're laying some of these pieces of parts out, uh, where we've structured the architecture, so when we Rio right now in our current configuration of the software-defined grid, uh, we're utilizing the computer to do some of the visualization, some of the comms, some of the optimization, and we'll show you a little bit about what we're doing as we go on. The real-time layer and the FPGA layer, we're exploiting all of that to take advantage of the modular architecture to do computation where it's needed in the time frame that it's needed. That also minimizes the I.O. between layers. I mean, think about this. If I was trying to do PWM inverter control, by passing the signals all the way up to a centralized computer and going back out, we'd never be able to control the loop or close the loop. But the neat thing about this is it allows you to explore and figure out where to play. Just like that. So that's what we're doing. To give you some examples that this is real, and actually if I had a camera, we could show it live. Uh, this is an example where I'm using the GPU and the inverter controller. Here's a couple of our really bright uh, researchers. And oh, by the way, our group is looking for people, so if you want to come be part of the full team, We've got a lot of young people, we've got a lot of old wrecks, but we're also looking to expand the collaboration utility. So these folks, he was a postmasters, she was currently a postdoc. We're also looking at utilizing this to train the next generation of researchers and operators in, in doing it now. And oh, by the way, I do the same thing again and earlier. I'm a first robotics mentor. So over the last five years, we have introduced some of the concepts you're going to see here in high school. We're using LabVIEW, rapid prototyping, teaching them Scrum, we're applying Lean Startup. So everything they do is a minimum viable prototype, from sketch to delivery. And oh, by the way, I'm going to embarrass him, but my son's here. I brought him here as his birthday present. So he can learn about the breadth of technology and the opportunities that are available to us, and the community of people that are doing cool things. And we just got a chance to go together last Thursday and Friday to attend Scrum Master training for hardware. Team Wiki Speed, Scrum Inc. And so he's learning something that's going to change his future, the high school kids, and we're implementing this in our research group at the lab to be able to do these things. So we can turn faster. 
We want really bright people, really bright, phenomenal set of skills, but we need to teach them to work together as a team. Because no individual that you're going to see here could have done this in the amount of time. This was done in a matter of months. So we went from zero to this in a matter of months on a shoestring budget. So that's that. We've got an MPPT, uh, maximum power point tracking, uh, inverter series with the same sort of setup. You can see it's, you know, copy, transform, combine. That's actually, according to Kirby Ferguson, the definition of innovation. You master the basics, you tweak it, you modify it to transform it, and you combine it in ways it's never been done before to provide real, real innovation. That's really what engineering and innovation is. That's what we're doing here. We're, we're building on a lot of things that, that Brian's been instrumental in doing in the power dev community. And so we're taking those and hopefully adding value and, and building a community that we can do reproducible research so that we can share and bootstrap this together. So here we've actually got solar panels and it's driving our global microgrid. So we've got this example. This case for energy storage. Uh, we've got a, an interdisciplinary researcher that's uh, working on his doctoral that's looking at chemistry agnostic battery management systems. So we're building in the models and the intelligence. And the other thing that we're doing here that I'll, that I'll hint at is we're looking at secondary life energy storage. So we're actually, excuse me, working with a company that's got a lot of batteries that are coming out of the use. And he doesn't care about the chemistry. So he wants to do a quick test, and then he wants to slide them in a pack and, and distribute them. And it needs to be self-monitoring and self-regulating, so we're building some of the intelligence to do that. So that's it. So this shows the basic building blocks of this topology that you're all probably very familiar with. Typically there's, there's a grid on one side from the power systems world. We're using power electronics and inverters that are going to change the world. And some of you in here are doing this. It allows you to scale up in power. It allows you to also do cross-linking in DC. And the fact that you can connect to the physical world with motor and generators or other things that we've done before. So this is, a, this is an example building block of some of the things we're leveraging on a low voltage microgrid, but that's not the only thing. Through the code simulation, we're actually able to rapidly go from an idea to an implementation in code to collect the data to improve the model so that we can iterate on our design much, much more rapidly. And right now we're using multi-sim. Multi-sim has been phenomenal. One of the coolest things about what's happening in multi-sim is the ability to go do floating point on FPGA. So now, at least for our researchers, they don't have to spend their time doing floating to fix to translation. I mean, in my opinion, in the world of cognitive radio and FPGA is the thing that's been the greatest obstacle to the incorporation and the adoption and the unleashing of that technology has been the tool flow. You had to have somebody, and I did this, I worked in our ASIC design group. We had digital designers and analog designers, they didn't even speak the same language. And then you step up to try to implement functionality and systems, they didn't speak the same language. So it was a huge challenge to unlock the potential design flow. You're working in a community now that's going to revolutionize that. So anyway, that's really, really cool. But it allows us to take the same models and implement them, in this case, on the GPIC, but we can also translate it into the CREO and then use that as a controller that we're using on higher power power electronics. Which gives us a larger sandbox to explore and optimize and do other things, but then we can throw away everything we don't need and move it back down, either to a single board RIO or some systems on, on module that we've talked about before, or other things. And the key here is learning in the sandbox as rapidly as possible what resources do I need. So a lot of times you don't know that. So create the options that leave you open to make those decisions just in time in a deployment. So this is really cool. It's unlocking a lot of possibilities in our research. And we're scaling up. So in this case, we show the work in single board RIOs and SOMs and our ability to go to the CREO, also the PXI, and integrate this. And in this case, it's, a, it's an agile stack. Now, there's several other companies that are doing very similar things. Uh, you saw an example here uh, on, on the floor. We've got other people that are doing things. We're working with one of researchers at Oak Ridge Drive National Laboratory. My goal is to create a modular, open, optical-oriented architecture so you can literally can drop in new IPTs. If the control interfaces are the same, right, you can reuse all of that and change the scale and the models and the dynamics that are there. So we're working in this space to be able to do that. So scaling up not only is happening here, but it's allowing us to rapidly transition to our own microgrid, which is a 480 microgrid at our distributed energy communications and control lab. So our goal is to bring in some of the comms and the controls and the other things up here. But we can rapidly go from 24 volt microgrid, microgrid controller, all the way up to an operational microgrid. And one of the things we're doing is we're changing over all the information, instrumentation in our uh, distributed energy and communications lab that has a connection to the TDA. And this is showing a mapping of where we're just stepping up the same functionality on the operational components that we have in our operational microgrid. 
Here's an example of how we're rapidly prototyping. We're taking the things that we've done at the 24 volt level, single cell or single pack level, and we're building a community energy storage system that's actually going to the house. So Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge National Laboratory has an integrated energy systems team that coming this fall, if you came to our campus, you will see a 3D printed house. And that 3D printed house has home monitoring, and it's got an inverter, and it's a smart house, and we're using secondary use batteries for energy in the house. And we're using a vehicle to generate the power that interfaces with the home. So you will be able to see this on the campus, on the quad, where you're seeing an intermix of technologies that are there that are unlocking the way that we look at things in the future. But our guys have been instrumental, and so these, I think I can say, well, I won't say, I won't tell you what vehicle is that of, but these are, these are lithium ion batteries. The KMA Auto is a used vehicle that has just been repackaged, rewired, and redistributed for home use in the day. The other thing we're doing is addressing security. And Jeff, what, what's the what time? I didn't see what time I started, so I won't make sure I don't. 20 minutes? Okay, I'll step it up. So one of the key issues are security, coming from the cognitive world and the software defined world. Um, there's a great need and concern that if we've got a reconfigurable platform, right, there's potential for nefarious activities to change the configuration without your knowledge. So you need to be able to sense it, detect it, do something about it, isolate it. We've got to assume that whether it's from natural or man-made, the grid's got to be resilient, right? So first it's got to know what's there, then it's got to know what to do. So in this case, we're building in technologies that allow us to explore lots of opportunities. Uh, one is a partnership that we're working with dispersive technology. This is really kind of cool. Um, dispersive is a virtualized network, software defined network. But they utilize IP streams much like a torrent or spread spectrum. So they'll take communications, for example, from, from me to Jeff, and instead of going direct or just normally through the route, it'll break it up. And it'll go off this reflector, and it'll go off this reflector, and it'll go off the other reflector. And oh, guess what? It can change the, the encryption strings on each one of these independently. And it can roll 36 seconds. So they've demonstrated that man in the middle is no longer an issue. You don't need a VPN. You don't need a firewall. Because you can never pull enough data out of the stream to reassemble a pack. Really interesting model. The other thing is they can dynamically throttle and change the bandwidth. So if I find I need more bandwidth between Jeff and I, I can put more channel in it and I can move it around. So if you layer on top of that a time-sensitive network, you've got some phenomenal capabilities to put information where you need it, when you need it, to put more intelligence or more control or more situational awareness to be able to do that. So you change the reconfigurability of underlying hardware, the routing sensors, the routing controls, you can change our future and you can potentially make it secure. The other key piece we're looking at is a a series of lightweight block ciphers that uh, some researchers have released which is called Cyber and Spec. These ciphers, block ciphers, are good for streaming. They can be implemented in an 8-bit PIC microprocessor or an FPGA. So we're looking at exploring from a defense in depth if you really needed a secure data stream, implementing that in the FPGA and potentially using DDN or DDS to manage the keys. So this sandbox allows us to explore that, right? It allows us to look at latencies, it allows us to look at performance, it allows us to look at interoperability to be able to do that. What this is going to allow us to do is to create a new generation of secure intelligent uh, devices for the grid, particularly when it comes to protection and smart movements. So one of the key things here is we've looked at uh, the doughboards and relays and we've implemented the relay function actually in the CREO to evaluate that, look at the data, look at the measurement. So that's another key piece of look. The other thing we've done is we've interfaced to existing real-time digital simulators. We're going to talk more about this in a minute. So this allows us to take everything we've done on a low voltage microgrid, we've created a local microgrid model, and we're interfacing hardware in a loop with existing RTDS simulators, real-time digital simulators and that, which is kind of neat. So now, where are we going? We've got an internally funded project that's going to build out five copies of this microgrid. So over the next few months, we're actually going to have five networkable microgrids. We haven't defined exactly yet if all of those are going to be 24 volt. We're actually looking at implementing one or two of those at 120, so it's a home. It's a nanogrid. So now we can interface with Nest and all the other measurements in the home and show it on the software-defined architecture and be able to explore all those from load management, your energy distribution, situational awareness to control as the Internet of Things is brought to the personal level from the standpoint. The real cool thing about this is we take all the elements that we have in the low voltage microgrid. We're looking at the ability to change the so one of the things that's not being addressed with networkable microgrids is when you island your island, right? But what if Brian's microgrid has a hospital? 
and he doesn't have enough energy capacity, and I just happen to be on a set of uh, commercial buildings, what if I had the crosslink capability to route my power off of my microgrid to Brian? Without anybody else having to interfere or deal with that. I don't have to go back to the main distribution feeder. I don't need to do anything else. And there's a new model for controls and bidirectional flow. It's got to be there. We're going to be able to explore that on this topology. The other thing we can take change, we can actually change the topology of this to look like just about any other microgrid you might want to. If I've got a mix of assets, software defined topology. I just change the configuration. So now I can look at system behavior, not just point behavior of devices, which is going to be critical when we look at scaling this up from resiliency and from stability control. So we're doing that. Kind of cool, kind of fun. Uh, the other key that we're looking at this because it's software defined, we're going to explore a whole variety of standards. There's some really neat work going on right now. OpenFMB is a neat exercise. DDS, the activity that local grid is doing. Uh, and some of the existing legacy standards. The key is that you've got old things that are out there that don't have the ability to change. So how can you implement a translator that allows you to map the functionality and functionality and availability that's there into your new emerging capability system? Well, we've got to be able to handle 3750, 61850, other kind of things that are there. And the key here is to make it multinational, not just one set of standards to the others. And the things that we learn, we really are hoping this will accelerate the standard development and interoperability and leverage risk. So we're working on that. And the other key piece is a simulator interface. So I'm going to pick up the pace. Grids here. Probably one of the most exciting things that we're working on. It's a self-aware, elastic, resilient, all those good things. Seer means more to more people than other things. One of the ways to think about this is the high performance computing for the grid. It's distributable, low latency, reconfigurable supercomputer for grid simulation. The other thing it needs to be able to do is to put the right level of simulation at the right place in the grid. So the ability to make it remote, configurable, time-sensitive linked is a key piece of this. But the other is just scalability of size. And you saw actually yesterday morning at the keynote some of the phenomenal work that's been done for the geophysical folks at ETH. Well, when Brian hooked me up with Lothar and told me about the things that they're doing, I saw that. It's the grid. Yeah, it's just a different set of equations. And so the dream here is to create this network of reconfigurable computers that you just download a new solver. Right? Just download a new solver. And eventually we'll create a multi-physics real-time or faster than real-time solver that, oh, by the way, is data-driven. You remember the thing I hinted about earlier about distributed models, models at the edge that tell you actually what they are and pass the parameters back up to their digital twin at the appropriate level in the hierarchy so that you can model and control and understand? We're building an infrastructure to be able to do that. So this is really, really cool. And it's going to unlock plug-in sim and plug-in control. So today, grid builders, planners, they design it, another set of engineers build it, another set of engineers install it. In the future, why can't we build it and do plug and play? So device A that's in the field reports back, the simulator says, oh, I know where you are. And oh, by the way, I can either point to a server and get your data model exemplar or whatever else. I can give you an example that runs locally. I can pass the parameters back up to me. I can share it. So now, and if you've ever looked at the way that we learn, that's exactly the way that we learn. When you learn to ride a bike, when you learn to play an instrument, when you learn to drive a car, it takes a lot of focus for the neocortex, particularly the frontal cortex. A lot of effort. But once you learn those things, you actually consolidate only the things needed to master that skill. You increase the speed between adjacent circuits with something that's called myelin. It pulls together the association regions. And guess what happens? It drops below the surface. And you're no longer consciously aware of the fact that you're a world-class concert pianist. Because you're not thinking about it here. It's pushed down in the subsumption architecture. But if I were able to dip the hammer in that key, you'd not sure you'd sense it and pick it up and make an adjustment, the grid's got to be able to do that. And what we're doing is creating an environment that allows us to do that. So when we looked at this and they looked at for ETS, what are the possible solutions to do real-time, just-in-time simulation, computing, and learning? Well, there's technology out there. We have high-performance computing. GPUs, the cloud. But when you look at the need to be able to inter interact with your environment, there's a brand new set of I.O. requirements that come into play. You've got to close the loop with the physical world if you're going to interact with and understand the physical world. And quite frankly, there are different time scales and different time domains. We heard this morning from Jeff the way that the retina preprocesses. And there's actually another control loop 
that deals with saliency and attention that drives the inner neurons in the motor cortex. And you don't need to know. Because you've learned over the years, you're looking for key information that gives you contextual cues that allow you to interpret where you are and deal with things. The grid's got to do the same things, which means we've got to build a reconfigurable architecture that allows us to create something that learns to learn and can handle that type of dynamics. So in that case, you've got to be able to put the right computation in the right place, so we're looking at neat opportunities here. But one of the things about existing compute technology, for example, just high-performance computing or just GPUs, is they don't allow us by, our, by themselves to address high bandwidth, low latency interaction with the real world. If all you wanted to do is to take data in and crunch on it and create a model that's accurate at the state that when you took that data, that's okay. We do it all the time. But in a changing world, is that adequate? If I ask you to drive down the street and every four seconds to open your eyes and then close them again, and open your eyes and close them again, how good do you think you're going to be able to drive? How safe? What do you think your insurance rates are going to be, right? So we've got to create a new system that interacts with our world at the right scale at the right level of detail. So we've got to do something else. So I think one of the things that's going to help us do that are FPGAs. Field programmable gate arrays. You know, by the way, a couple of years ago, I think eventually you're going to see field programmable analog arrays and field programmable neural arrays because you can compute implicitly at the analog scale things that you can't do digitally when you really need high speed interactions with the physical world. That's all coming. So let's build our architecture to exploit that as it comes, right? You can do it. So, and we've been working on that some of the lab. So the really cool thing about this is you're able to take an instantiation of your model and drop it into a piece of hardware without even thinking about it. It can be floating form. It can interact with your world with the right fidelity that you need. And it allows you to drop the right type of computation that you need to interact with other pieces. So this is a phenomenal capability that we're going to have at our disposal. It's going to change the way we do research in the build system. So I think it's incredibly useful for us. The massive parallelism, the ability to do just-in-time, time-aware processing. And I'm, I'm adding that to the mix, right? Because things happen at a different scale. So we don't want to time synchronize so everything happens computationally in the nanosecond level. It's a waste. As a matter of fact, you realize that the fastest neuron in your brain you know how fast it's running? 100 hertz. Some are a little faster. So we're dealing with a computer that runs slower than anything we've ever produced before. And oh, by the way, with components that their variability, you would never get a chip off the processing line. If you force neuron to match neuron the same way we do gates in the integrated circuit world, we would all be weak gates. <laughs> But what happens, we come out with a topology that learns to learn and adapts in real time by its interaction with the environment. So what we can do this here, leveraging these kind of technologies, putting intelligence and learning where you need it, when you need it, in the system. So that's going to be pretty key. So the risk to your architecture of the future, and this is actually leveraging an awful lot of work that's already happened, is the ability to leverage CPU and eventually GPU, uh, interconnects among those to stream the models using best of class. One of the key things for our industry it's going to, be able, going to be the ability to take existing models that engineers have, have researched and be able to almost think about them as cross-compiling them to take advantage of the underlying model. If you can do that with different solvers, you can tap an unlimited resource of existing research. So that's going to be a key factor as we move forward, but we've got to build some use cases as we go. So anyway, phenomenal, incredible opportunity of adjacent market opportunities. Things that have been done at ETH, I believe we can leverage from the grid, and we can do it at multiple time scales. And we've got to have it. Traditional grid transmission generation is a completely different time scale than the power electronics that are happening in the microgrids and the inverters. But they have to exist in the symbiotic world. And oh, by the way, the information that's passed up from the interaction of layers has to be at the appropriate level of temporal and spatial resolution to give you the ability to close the loop and drive it. So we need to pull these things together. A couple of the keys, and then I'll end up. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the funnest, I think, is something we call continuous data driven model development. Just learning. Can we create an architecture that learns and learns to learn? So it's continuous, it's data driven. In a changing world, you can't learn thing, one thing word once right and expect it to always be the same. It's always changing. If I took you today and I blindfolded you and I dropped you in a different place in the convention center, how long do you think it would take you to realize where you are? Because you've lost context. We move in space and time. Our systems exist in space and time in a continuum. So until we can create an environment that allows our systems to learn 
and to keep and adapt and interact that way, we're always going to have fragile, non-resilient systems. So how do we do this? And if we're able to do this, it's going to allow us to radically change the way the systems work together. It enables what's called a subsumption architecture. We saw an example of Baxter on stage yesterday. What, what we weren't told is that it came from the MIT lab of Rodney Brooks, where one of the things they finally figured out is to teach things to learn, you just got to allow them to have a simple set of rules that they learn to learn with goal-directed behavior. Because they could never control the moving of walking legs in a coordinated fashion that would give you resilient, stable gait. Why? Because conditions change. So you as a programmer can never anticipate all of those conditions. So you've got to create systems that allow you to be able to do that. That's called a subsumption architecture. It allows you to do multiple closed loops, but you're only passing the appropriate set of information in a big analog data world to the appropriate level that needs to make the decision. So that provides for a completely new scale of architecture of control and interaction with the physical world. Plug-in sim, plug-in control. I'm only going to highlight this because I don't have a lot of time to get into it, but this is a real-time example right now that I've been working with Brian and Jim Nagel to do. My doctoral research was in ill-posed inverse problems. And in that doctoral research, I took multiple tools, distributed uh, differential evolution, which is a way to look at global search, uh, content gradient, which allows you to learn locally, local speed. I combined those in something that was called um, localized kernel migration, multivariate, which allowed you to adapt in N dimension simultaneously the amount of smoothness that you needed in this individual space to create a model for interaction. So we're working on this right now. One of the really cool things that Jim has been able to do is implement code far faster than I can. And so we're working on a tool suite using Jade, which is an adaptive differential evolution and other things, on real-time digital twins. And right now, Orion's got things working that not only are you learning the, the, the model of the inverters, we're actually able to take the junction temperatures of the IWTs and have a prediction model for that and control the switching modalities and not a software-defined radio graph, so I'm going to trade some modulation, right? There's some other really clever things you can do, oh, by the way, instead of using PWM. It'll radically change the behavior of IWTs. The same thing we learned from the modulation world. We'll get to that in another talk at another time. But the cool thing is that you can use that knowledge to limit the thermal temperature in the IWTs, which, oh, by the way, extends the life of your power electronics. So now you're getting into situational awareness contingency-based uh, monitoring and planning for power electronics that we've had, and we saw today, in understanding bearing runout and other things in our electric mechanical. We're going to have the ability to do the same thing in the electromagnetic space. With this thing. Really cool, unlimited, untapped potential. But this allows you to do the same thing at various levels in your architecture. If I can do it at the highest speed of the inverter controller, I can pass on to the next level up. It's looking at the micro microgrid controller assets and the next level up. And we can pass them up and down and learn. So there's a new thing that we can do for high-speed compact representation. So what does that mean? If we put all these things together, I believe we can create a new future that enables the next generation of real-time data-driven plug-in sim controls for complex adaptive systems, which is the grid. But it goes from generation anywhere to consumption anywhere. That's a change, a radical change of being able to do that from the radical model. So grid seer interacts with the real world and it learns and it passes its digital twin from the contextualized learning that it is at the right place in the network. It allows you to provide shared learning. The cool thing is, is that one of the things one device learns, it could actually pass around to another device. It says, I've seen this exception. You need to be looking for this. You just build that in and pass it around. You've got an architecture that allows it to do that. Really cool stuff. So what does that unlock? It unlocks something that's called perception action control cycle. Turned by Hakeem Fuster, who's probably, in my opinion, one of the most foremost cognitive scientists in the world. Uh, he's looked at the ability of multiple neural regions in the brain to do real-time learning and what's happening in the interaction regions. And he's argued that this assumption architecture, this interaction with the real world, this perception action cycle, is exactly that. We develop models, we have goals, we interact. We take the feedback from the world and we adapt our models in real time so that we can achieve the goals by reducing the ambiguities between our models of the known world and what we just learned in the update. It's got Bayesian inference associated with it, but it doesn't have the complex Bayesian statistics. I don't know if you realize that or not, but you're not running Bayesian priors and a posteriori computation in your brain. Nothing is in the animal kingdom. We've, we've approximated that with computations and mathematical models. We can build systems that do that. So that's going to allow us to look at some new kinds of architectures for intelligent systems. 
uh, allow us to do co-simulation and learning faster than real-time prediction so we can look at scenarios. Remember the holodeck? Computer, what's going to happen? We can create a grid simulator that can do other things that would allow us to do these sorts of things in the future. So therefore, we can explore the methods of machine learning, reinforcement learning, cognitive control, and hierarchical hidden market models, and other stories in the So, I end with that. Hopefully it's been a little bit of infotainment, so to speak, I guess. Um, the point is, is we're trying to put together this ecosystem that allows us as a group of researchers to move science faster and to generate reproducible research. And the ability to take anything that's done in my lab and pass it to you. The one thing that I did show in this grid seer architecture, and actually, actually they didn't animate, but we're building the shadow network to monitor what's going on. We're developing a network so that we can take data use cases and reference use cases so as we create topologies in our research platform, all researchers can share in that data. So we've got the topologies and the use cases that we're operating, we've got the data that's there without doing it. What's not shown behind the guy in the question here is a communications interconnect that allows us to collaborate with users. So right now we're in discussions not only with NI but a couple of universities where they want to offer courses that their students actually log in and do research on our software defined grid. So they can do look at inverter controls, prediction controls, other things that are happening in a system, not just a model, in a system, and explore that and then pull the models back. And to be able to interact. And then the other probably coolest thing is I've got a couple of universities that want to do cyber war games. So what we want to be able to do is to do a set of cyber war game exercises. So that you could take a variety of topologies and you can allow Red Hatters to try to attack it. And we can see what happens on the microgrid, on the grid, on a physical grid that's operating at 24 volts. Because here if we short it, or here if we change the, the modulation waveform on the inverter, or here if we run the motors backwards, we're not going to do real costly damage, but we're going to learn an incredible amount about the grid and about its interconnectedness and about its system behavior that you'll never get from a simulator. And then the web operators and also the smart grid, and nobody else is going to let you do on your existing grid until you can find a way to prove it and validate it. And you know what you do though? The same control algorithms that work on the 24 volt grid, it's where they're going. With the click of a button, I can deploy them to the operational grid. Which also means when you see something in the wild that you observe, you can pull that back in your simulator and you can try to reproduce it and learn it on the other. So it's an incredible ecosystem, it's an incredible opportunity to do research together. One of the enormous enablers is, is the things that you and I have put together in both hardware and software. So I'm done. Thank you for your time. You've been really patient. You're not throwing anything. That's good. <coughs> Jeff, we have time for a question? Yeah. No questions? One back. So in that particular case, we're actually using a set of IGBTs that are, that are operating in 10 kilowatts. So you can do it multiple ways, right? You can take one that operates at 100 kilowatts, and we can run it and operate it at 10 kilowatts only because it's running at the, the low voltage of our low voltage microgrid. So one of the reasons we did it is to take actually the identical hardware, not just the controllers, but the power electrons themselves. And a lot of times, the guys that are doing the research, they scale it up that way anyway, right? They'll start at a lower voltage or current level, and then they'll run it part of it is for research reasons, uh, part of it is as we, as we transition, for example, the GPICs, they can't handle the voltage and current we need on our 480 volt microgrid. So our progression allows us to do the same thing there and look at this behavior and then immediately. So does that make sense? It's trying to close the loop for research much faster. Yeah, well, great question. Well, I either told you a bunch of stuff that you didn't believe or... Yes? Did you hear about microgrid? Wow, so the question was, you, you hear a lot of stories about the vulnerabilities and the potential vulnerabilities of the grid from a cyber physical standpoint. Um, and he was asking if I had any real data to share. I guess the easy question is, if I did, I probably could share it. <laughs> um, but from a practical standpoint, energy storage. You know, and actually I was at uh, a summit looking at lithium 
battery energy storage. And there's a real concern because of the thermal runaway, right? You've all seen the, the videos of the battery pack on flight that burned, and we've seen other kind of things, and there's other videos out there. And so that was just from a thermal pack runaway, right? And there's some other things that are going on there. So one can think, if I can take over your inverter, and I can change the charging rate or something else, one could conceivably, you know, cause thermal <coughs> runaway as opposed to it having it out. So I mean, that's a that's an example of something that could happen. It's real. I mean, we've already seen uh, people hacking into automobiles and changing the braking systems or the ignition system. Well, the same kind of electronics that are happening on the pico grid of your car, <laughs> if you want to think about it that way, the same sort of interfaces, the same sort of controls are built throughout the ecosystem, right? So. There's some of that. But the real question comes back to resiliency, right? Or, or reliability. So if you create a grid that's got real time situation awareness and you can see and detect these things, the easiest and fastest things you want to do is isolate it, right? Isolate it physically. And that's what uh, fast switches and relays and, and, and telerotors are designed to do. They isolate it so that you can figure out what's going on and do something. Well, if you have the same ability from the intelligence standpoint, do things in a more automated fashion. But you know, there's lots of studies. Uh, there's several um, use cases and, and databases that are out there that are supposedly documenting um, vulnerabilities for SCADA systems. So just simply, if you look at the same kind of things that, that might be there in any SCADA system, conceivably could be there in the grid in the future. Probably the, the, the biggest thing to think about is that currently most of our grid is not on. A lot of grid operators, the easiest way to do it, right, is just not to have it connected. Because if, if you can't communicate with it, it's going to be a whole lot harder to introduce man-made problems. You still have all, all the natural things that they have. So, you know, that's kind of in the way that we've operated historically, right? If you, if you can't connect and communicate with it, or, it's, or if it's physically isolated, you minimize the risk of the vulnerabilities. But as we look to the grid of the future, that looks more like a communications device than is an Internet of Things. And actually, probably the most easy example to take a look at is the transformative manufacturing. The automated process line of electronics. I mean, the, the same models of control and other things or the things that we're going to see in other places. So I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, and I probably could <laughs> or would uh, in that particular case. But there's studies that we do with some studies that are out there. Uh, the interesting thing is going to be look at what's happening in Europe because they're actually ahead of the U.S. in some of the distribution automation and some of the other things that are there and, and, and see kind of what's happening there, what they're learning. Good question. Yeah. 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 All right, well, thank you for your time. Uh, go have some lunch.